Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The Gospel of the Lord. On Friday, I, I went to go help my brother move into the new house that he just bought up in Warner, New Hampshire, up by Lake Sunapee. And my brother and his family have been looking for a house for two years. It's been really hard in the current market, but they finally had an offer accepted. And just in time, they had twins born a few weeks ago, so they really needed a big house. And I have to say, the new house they got was worth the wait. It's like a quintessential New England farmhouse. It looks like something out of a Robert Frost poem with a stone wall in the back and an apple orchard across the street. Of course, with home prices and interest rates being so high, I think my brother has quite the mortgage payment every month. And, uh, but it's home sweet home, even if it costs you an arm and a leg. But, you know, we had the real estate closing Friday morning, and we walked into their new house. And the very first thing on my brother's mind was, I want to bless my new house. And so we went around and we sprinkled all the different rooms with holy water and we said prayers and we hung a crucifix and we hung a picture of the sacred heart of Jesus in the home. And of course, it's very convenient when you have a brother that's a priest and we had got the whole place blessed within an hour of them moving in. But I would expect nothing less from my brother. I really admire my brother and his family. They really do seem to put God first in their life and everything they do. And isn't that what Jesus says is the first and the greatest commandment? The first commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. If we don't put the love of God first in our life, if we put something else in the first place in our life, it seems like nothing else quite works out the way it's supposed to. If we get first things first, if we put God first, if we give him the first of our energy, the first of our time, the first of our gifts, something kind of amazing happens. Everything else in our life sort of snaps into place. Not in the sense that we don't have worries and, and problems like everyone else, but when, we, when they do happen, we have God at the center of things. He's a foundation. He's an anchor for our life. Isn't that what Jesus says? The person who builds their, house, builds their life on God's word is like a man who builds his house on the rock. No matter what storms come, no matter what wind blows, that house is going to stand because it is built solidly on the rock. Maybe my brother has his house built on more than just the stone wall out back. Maybe there's a rock foundation there that will stand no matter what. But that's just the first commandment, love God. The second is like it, Jesus says. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. As convenient as it is to have a brother who's a priest and can bless things, it's also very convenient to have a brother who can lift heavy objects. And right after I was done blessing the house, I started working on what I was really there for, which was to move about 10,000 boxes from their old apartment into their new house in the largest U-Haul I've ever seen. And I was amazed because their apartment really is not that big, and yet they had more stuff stuffed in there than I could possibly have imagined. They seemed to have thrown nothing out, and uh, even just my nephews alone had about a thousand boxes of Legos that we had to move onto the truck. And it was all going over to their new house. Now, did I really want to spend my Friday afternoon moving heavy boxes, especially when it was 80 degrees and I had sweat pouring off me? No, I did not. But it's one of those things that you do for your brother because you love him. And it's not just for your brother. In fact, I wasn't the only one there helping him. He had all these friends and neighbors around. It was like the whole neighborhood had come out to help him. And it was great. It reminded me almost of like an Amish barn raising ceremony where the whole neighborhood shows up and everyone chips in. 
and there was people moving stuff onto the truck, and there were other people cleaning the house inside, and other people were preparing food for all those who were working. And that's the way it should be. Neighbors loving one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not just because if you help your neighbor to move, maybe they'll help you in return, but because Jesus commands it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And who is my neighbor, the scholar of the law asks, especially in Luke's version of this gospel. And that's when Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan. Sometimes your neighbor is not just the person who happens to live next door. Your neighbor could be someone who lives in a totally different land, who's from a different people. It might even be someone you consider an enemy, but that is your neighbor as well. So you should love him and allow yourself to be loved by him. Now, I'm from New Hampshire. I don't even know my next-door neighbors necessarily. Uh, in fact, this week, I got a call from one of my next-door neighbors in Exeter. I didn't even know his name, but he left a voicemail because he said that our maintenance man at the church had blown all the leaves over from the church property onto his property. And I have to give him credit. He didn't do what most people from New Hampshire would do, which is just blow the leaves right back. He actually called me. And so I went over and I knocked on his door and we talked face to face. And now I know his name. And I sent the maintenance man over to clean up the leaves. How blessed it is when neighbors live in unity. But again, our neighbor is not just the person who happens to live next door. It's one thing to help your neighbor because, hey, they might you want them to blow leaves back over. You help them because they'll help you. That's nice. But it's another thing entirely to love someone who may never be able to pay you back to love someone who may not have any home uh, to move into, who might come from a faraway place. This is what God says in, in the reading from Exodus today. You shall not molest or oppress an alien, a migrant from another land, for you yourselves were once aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall not wrong any widow or orphan. You shall not take advantage of one of your poor neighbors. These are people who can't pay us back, perhaps, who uh, don't have a home to move into so readily. But God is commanding us to pay attention to them as well, maybe to especially pay attention to them. And there are so many examples of people who help in these ways. I'm thinking of uh, this weekend, Cardinal O'Malley asked every church down in Boston to talk about the migrant crisis that's happening down in that state right now. And there are so many people moving in that need just basic, basic needs met. Like they need winter clothing for this winter because it's fast upon us. They need food, they need shelter. And so he's asking every parish in Boston to open up their shelters, open up homes, open up their parishes if need be to help. And I'm really interested to see what's gonna happen because when the Catholic uh, community gets mobilized, it, we're almost as good as the Amish. We can really do a tremendous amount. But I think of so many others as well. I think of Caitlin, who is, we're going to hear for her, from her a little bit later, but she's going down to Peru to help out in an orphanage down there. Good job, Caitlin. And that's what today God commands us to do, take care of the widows and the orphans. I think of a story of parishioners that I just heard that uh, opened up their home to adopt a child with Down syndrome recently and brought her into their home. Uh, I, I think of the the people up in Lewiston, Maine, who, uh, in the face of some unspeakable tragedy, rallied around one another. And it seems like it often happens in the midst of a, a real tragedy that people s finally come together and support one another. And there were people there tending to the wounded, mourning with those who lost loved ones, helping law enforcement agents who had come into their community. Uh, we, this is what happens, sadly, sometimes when tragedy strikes but it can happen at any time, it should happen at any time, that we really rely on one another. Something amazing happens when we're able to open up our hearts and our homes in this way to our neighbor, when we're truly able to love our neighbor, I think that's when we're really able to also love ourselves. That's what is at the end of Jesus' words today. We sometimes miss it. Sometimes we think that Jesus says something like, well, love your neighbor instead of yourself, but he doesn't say that. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. We're supposed to love ourselves, uh, not in a selfish way. And yes, in the proper order, God first, others second, then ourselves. But we are supposed to love ourselves because we are lovable. And that's why the love of neighbor 
opens us up to the love of God. It's the second commandment is like the first one. Because when we love our neighbor with all of their faults, all of their sins, all of their weaknesses, all of their foibles, maybe we, be, we begin to realize, okay, well, maybe I can be loved as well with all my foibles, with all my sins, with all my weaknesses. God loves me in that way. And maybe I can love someone else. You know? And if we don't think we have foibles, if we don't think we have sins like our neighbor, we might want to look again. I, there's a story of a young couple who moved into their very first home. And the first morning they were there in their home, they were having breakfast and they were looking out the window and there was the neighbor next door hanging up her laundry on the clothesline. And the wife turned to the husband and said, dear, look at, look at our neighbor. She's hanging up the laundry, but it, the laundry is so dirty. It's like she doesn't know how to do it. She didn't do a very good job cleaning. She's not making our neighborhood look all that great. Look at those sheets. They're all dirty and, and she needs some new soap. Maybe I should go over and tell her how to do it. Well, the next day, the same thing at breakfast, the same thing. There was the neighbor hanging dirty laundry. She had the same comment to make. This, occurred, this happened almost every day for about a month. And finally, after a month, the wife looked out at breakfast, and there was the neighbor hanging her laundry. But this time, the laundry was totally clean. It was bright white. And she said to her husband, wow, she must have finally learned how to do it. She must have gotten some Clorox or some Tide or something that really helped her have white sheets now. And the husband said, well, after a month of being here, I thought it was finally time to clean the windows. <laughs> Sometimes we don't see clearly because we need to clean our windows. That's what the love of God does. That's what love does. When we love God with our whole hearts, when we love our neighbor as ourselves. When we love ourselves, even as God loves us, it's like we can see clearly, maybe for the first time in our life, what our life is all about, how it should be ordered. We're able to see what must be done and do what we have seen. 